as much as, you know, we want to make things simple and, you know, I think a lot of people in the low carb space want to like totally ignore LDL cholesterol and, and, and not look at it all, but, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You have to consider everything. Like you said, the whole kind of symphony of different markers. What are some of your other favorite markers to really show you what you need to know about metabolic health in somebody? Yeah. I mean, I, I really love fasting insulin levels and, and a HOMA IR, which uh, combines fasting insulin and glucose. I love triglycerides and HDL triglyceride to HDL ratio, I think is really important. And I like advanced lipid markers, you know, looking at VLDL, looking at small LDL particles. Um, those are, they tell you so much more about the lipids than just the, the basic profile. And of course I really like inflammatory markers, CRP and LPPLA2, which is like a marker kind of specific for lipid inflammation. Um, I think those all really help round out the picture so much better. And then, and now the use of CGMs, I think is really a game changer for metabolic health, which, you know, CGMs have come under fire by some for if you're using them in people without type two diabetes, which I just don't quite understand because you can Why? learn so much from a CGM. You can learn so much. Now, I think, I think the, the one, the one, um, probably reasonable pushback is that you don't need a flat line. Like it's not, if it's not a flat line, you're in danger. So if you go that far, okay, that's one thing, but that, that's not what most people are saying. Most people are saying you want to know when you're having big rises and how long it's your glucose is staying up. You want to know how your body's reacting to the things you eat, the things you do. If you get a bad night's sleep, if you drink too much alcohol, you want to know how your body and your blood sugar is reacting to that. I think it's such a great learning tool that we should be using more of for that reason. That's a shame that people are dissuading people from using them. I haven't heard that actually. I, I think that's one of the very best tools that people can use because it will self-correct. You don't even have to know anything about nutrition. You'll just know how you feel and be able to look at this monitor and you'll make better decisions on your own. So that's yeah. a little disappointing. Um, I do love that you mentioned HDL to triglyceride. I, I kind of feel like that would tell me, I don't know, like 80% of what I would want to know about somebody's metabolic health. Would you say that's a fair statement? Yeah, I think that is a great, um, a great point. And so, you know, the advanced lipid tests I like and the advanced sort of insulin resistance tests I like, if you can't get those, the triglyceride HDL ratio is a pretty good surrogate for those. They, they tend to go hand in hand frequently. Um, I, I like data, so I, I prefer more data if you can get it. But if you can't, that triglyceride to HDL ratio is, is really good. You know, anything less than 1.5 tends to be really good. Anything less than one is outstanding. But um, yeah, yeah, it's a good one yeah. to use. I, I appreciate that opinion. Okay, so we've had a bit of a phenomenon in the low carbohydrate space, and we're getting to this point where we've been looking at this for a while now, and we can conduct studies. So one thing that tends to happen with a certain subset of people when they start a ketogenic diet is they feel amazing. They generally will lose weight. They will generally lose fat. Their brain energy will improve. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the brain here later on. And, and all of those things are great. We see that triglycerides drop out, the fat that's traveling around the blood. There's less of it. That's great. Blood glucose, typically lower. That's great. Uh, HDL cholesterol, that's really great too. That starts to rise. That's, that's, that's awesome. But we see that the LDL cholesterol can go high for certain people, like definitely above where a doctor would want it. And with some people, it can go extremely high. So this, this, you know, pattern could show that your, you know, your triglycerides were maybe 45, your HDL cholesterol was maybe 75, which is really good. And all of a sudden your LDL cholesterol, which should be like 100 to 130 on a standard panel is now like 400, 500, like crazy scary numbers. And again, we've seen this for a while. We have been studying this now a little bit closer. How excited are you about this research that's going on? And do you think this will change the conversation about what is actually causing heart disease? Yeah, so great question. And I, and I want to answer that. But before I answer it, I, I, I want to point out, though, that we have to understand this population is the exception, not the rule. And I think that's that's such an important point to me because I think so many clinicians, physicians, even average day people hear about this and say, whoa, I don't want to try a keto diet because my LDL is going to skyrocket. No. If you look at the studies using a keto diet for type 2 diabetes or for weight loss, on average, the LDL does not change. On average, the LDL does not change. I need to keep saying that over and over again because that's what happens the majority of the time. So yes, there is this population, which we is fascinating and we need to learn more about, 
but it's important to emphasize that they're the minority. So I would never think I would never dissuade someone from doing a keto diet because they're afraid their LDL is going to skyrocket because chances are very good. It will not now. Fair point. Fair point. Thank you. Yeah. But, but it's such an amazing um, subset of people and such an incredible physiologic change that is like really putting sort of lipidology upside down on his head. And that's why it's getting so much attention, rightly so. But we have to understand, you know, the chances of it happening if you start a keto diet are, are much higher in a small subset of people and not the general population. But all right, I've went on enough about that. So now am I excited about these studies? Absolutely. I mean, look, from a... From a cardiologist standpoint and a doctor standpoint, I get it. These numbers are terrifying from an LDL standpoint because the only time anybody has seen these numbers before is with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or the most severe cases of heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So quick definition, familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disorder that you're basically born with where some part of your LDL clearing system is, is dysfunctional. So whether it's the LDL receptor, it's the ApoB receptor, or there's something on the LDL particle or the LDL receptor that is, that is not functioning well. So the LDL just accumulates in your body, the particles accumulate in your body. And if you have homozygous, that's where both alleles of your genes, all our genes have two alleles, that's where both of them have a mutation. And if you have heterozygous, one is a mutation. So if you have homozygous FH and you have LDLs of the 500 plus, it is a devastating condition where people are getting heart attacks at young ages and dying at young ages. If you have heterozygous FH, where your LDLs are on average more in like the two to 300 range, can be higher, but more in like the two to 300 range, that's a lot more heterogeneous. It's not quite as uniformly devastating. Now, some people do get premature heart disease, um, but it's not nearly the same penetration as it is with homozygous. But so the point being for that is, is I understand why it's so scary because that's the only context we have for ever seeing these numbers. Now it's a whole different context. Wait, there's no, there's no FH. You know, you do genetic tests on these people. They don't have the genes for FH. They usually don't even have the polygenic risk scores, meaning when you combine a whole bunch of different genes, they don't even have those polygenic risk scores. And they're incredibly otherwise healthy, usually metabolically healthy. Like you were saying about the triglycerides, HDL, usually their glucose, their insulin, they're thin, they're lean, they're active. Like nothing fits that this person is in trouble except for that one number. So I, I get why, why it's so, so nerve wracking for so many clinicians and individuals not knowing uh, what to do. And that's why I think the research is just amazing and fascinating that Dave Feldman, one of the premier citizen scientists in the, in the world paired up with one of the premier cardiovascular researchers in the world, Dr. Matthew Budoff. And they're doing this study, which they, they presented the preliminary data at Denver, which, you know, small sample size preliminary, but boy, is it not what anybody really expected? I mean, these people had average LDLs of like 250 and they'd been in keto for more than four years. And you'd expect some plaque, especially since the average age was like 50 something. You'd expect quite a bit of plaque um, if this was such a dangerous condition and there was much less than anybody would have expected. Now, preliminary, not published. They're going to publish it, of course. They're going to compare it with a, with a control set. And this, all this is going to be fascinating. I mean, and then plus they have the one-year trial where they're gonna do the CT angiograms at the end of the year. So at a minimum, at a minimum, this is going to help thousands of people better understand what's going on with their bodies. At a maximum, it is going to change everything that we think about LDL and cardiovascular risk. I mean, it's maybe it'll be somewhere in the middle there, but it's got that potential to do that because if people are walking around with LDL levels at FH levels, at levels that just scare us beyond belief, and nothing's happening in terms of heart attacks and dying, like if that doesn't force us to sort of change or refocus or revisit our hypotheses and our and our and our biases and our understanding of what's going on then i don't know what does so it's it's really got a lot of potential to to shake things up and you know it's going to get a lot of pushback no question anytime something is trying to change a paradigm or question a paradigm it gets pushback no question about it but but that's what science is, right? Science is asking the question. Science is not assuming things. Science is testing your hypotheses. And that's what they're doing. And I'm very thankful that they are. And I can't wait to see it unfold.